So, um, in the equipment will, of course, arrive in another 10 minutes, so um, you'll go without pictures for now, but let me welcome you. Um, we're really honored. I, I, my name is Donna Varensky Walker from Rebuilding Alliance. I'm the founder of Rebuilding Alliance. Our work um, is focused on helping rebuild Palestinian homes and schools and bringing the world together to keep them safe. Um, we are really honored to have you as our audience on this day when we bring you the families and children of Susia village and of Umal Hare village. We're here for some rather big challenges. Um, but we're here on International Peace Day. We're here on a day when hundreds of thousands of children around the world have been making pinwheels for peace. And uh, a group of school children are here also, having made their pinwheels of, for peace and added it to the ones that are coming from Susia and from Umlahe. What is this, what is this movement of pinwheels and, and such? Um, Um, this movement of, with Pinwheels for Peace has been going on for 10 years. Two teachers in Florida asked children to write down what peace means to them and to draw what it looks like. And you'll, if you go to pinwheelsforpeace.com, you'll see really hundreds of thousands of children doing this. Why did it matter? Why does it matter? The Rebuilding Alliance helped rebuild a, a kindergarten in a village called al -Aqba, a Palestinian village also under demolition orders, still is under demolition orders. The, our effort to, to build that kindergarten attracted investment from 20 other countries. That investment led to 20 other diplomatic corps speaking out for al -Aqba village. And it, 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 that, their pinwheels for peace, they're coming to Congress with us are asking members of Congress to make a call, a simple call, to the Israeli Embassy and to the State Department. That's been keeping a lack of a village standing. It's what we hope will happen with Susia, with Umbelfair, and with the over 11,000 other structures that are under demolition order at this time. We took this very urgently, as we, we took this matter very urgently. We thought it important to come to Congress. The Building Alliance was here for Susia in June. In July, the Israeli army informed Susia that they would be demolishing at the end of Ramadan. That was actually some, some breathing room, a week's time. And because of our effort, because of a, an international push, um, the State Department responded boldly. They sent the Consul General, Acting Consul General, to Susia. They did a public briefing. Representative Anna Eshu and 10 others signed her letter to the State Department, a public letter. Other Congress people followed. Um, Representative Loretta Sanchez with her letter. And soon after, Senator Dianne Feinstein published her letter to the Prime Minister of Israel, um, urging for legislative certainty for this village, urging the legal certainty for the, that they should be allowed to plan and exist, they, the, not to demolish, but to, to give them their future. Um, we're, we hope, we know that it led to good things so far, and the village is standing, so you see us there. And we, we, um, we're encouraged that the Israeli army is in negotiation with the village. But this is not the time to stop. You don't want to see the outcome be negative. You actually want Congress members to continue to call, to continue to express their concern. And so we're here. We bring children of Susia, the parents from Susia. We bring our colleagues from Um el parents and children, and also a member of Villages Group. I'll quickly ask each person on our team to introduce themselves, and then we'll begin a little bit more in depth of, of um, a discussion. Um, let me just quickly ask Kelly to introduce yourself since you're on that side. Hi, I'm Kelly Hoffman. I'm the 
Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Kelly Lamont Lane, and I'm a special projects manager at the Golden Alliance. It's just an introduction. Hello, my uh, name is Fatima Anwar from uh, Sufia village, South Hebron Hills, Palestine. I am a regional uh, uh, programming association. Fatima is the assembly chair for the Rural Women's Association of the South Hebron Hills. And what you should know about Fatima and her son, Mahmoudi, um, but especially about Fatima, she, she walked five kilometers to school each morning and, and back home. This is a woman who's determined from the very start to get, her, get the best grades and to get a solid education. And now is a leader in the community with the formation of the South Hebron Hills Rural Women's Association. Um, my name is David Massey, mm -hmm. member of the is it on? Is it on? So my name is David Massey. I'm a member of the Israeli Palestinian organization called the Villages Group. Um, and I live in Tel Aviv, Israel. Yeah. My name is Zid Avelin, I am from the villages of Omar Khair uh, in South Northern Hebron. So I should mention that David is a filmmaker um, and the Villages Group is uh, a, a very small group of Israelis and Palestinians who have been working very closely with Omar Khair and, and in the South Hebron Hills and with Susia. Um, Eid is an artist, um, and you'll, hopefully you'll want to learn more about the art that he um, pursues. Uh, ask him about it after our briefing. Please. Hello, I am Nanda Al-Hadalim al Um al Khair, South Hebron. I am a school teacher, and I am a mother of three daughters. Israeli civil administration over these procedures, 
A number of private Palestinian planning groups um, and Israeli groups as well, funded by European Union donors and others, have started to file master plans um, for residents in villages like Susia. And one of the reasons why that they realized how important the master planning process was is because when a home or a school or a barn um, has a demolition order issued against it, one of the main reasons that is, is given and that you'll hear about is that this is illegal construction. It's unpermitted construction, which means it was built without a permit. One of the reasons that villagers are often given for their failure to obtain a building permit from the ICA is lack of a master plan. So if you think, well, this town doesn't have a master plan, we don't know where they can build homes or where they can be still, uh, build schools, so how could we issue a building permit in accordance with this plan? So Susia, that we're here today to talk about, and also from Mulher, but Susia in particular is one of these towns stuck in a bureaucratic nightmare without end. In 1983, an Israeli settlement was built very nearby the old village of Susia on the other side of the Green Line. Three years later, in 1986, the Israeli army forcibly removed the residents from their land and declared Old Susi an archaeological site. In 2001, the caves that they were living in were again demolished by the Israeli army. With no other choice, they moved to their nearby agricultural lands and erected temporary structures like tents or structures with tin roofs because they were um, refused building permits every time that they applied. So in 2012, with the help of Rabbis for Human Rights and Israeli organization, they submitted five alternative outline plans to the Israeli Civil Administration with the hope that the ICA would accept one of them, would approve one of them, and allow the village to build on the land that they legally own. The ICA rejected it, and despite a petition to the courts to ask for a reconsideration of the plan, in May of this year, the High Court refused to issue an injunction on demolition order, which means that while the case, um, or while the plan is being reheard, or while this process is in the Israeli court system, demolitions could happen at any time. And this is when Rebuilding Alliance, and some of our partners started to be very aware of the situation, very worried, and why we came to Congress and why we're still here. What happened in May is that for the first time, even though the residents of Susia are in the legal process right now, the courts have refused to issue a, um, a freeze order on the demolition orders that affect almost the entire village of Susia. So previously, um, when you would file a master plan or apply for a building permit, it would put a freeze. And what means that a new precedent that, that has been set in Susia's case means that any of the uh, over 11,000 pending demolition orders could theoretically be demolished at any time, even though they have filed these plans in a legal fashion. So Susia is one of only many villages, and what you'll also hear about in Mohair, that has been frustrated and humiliated by this process that does not benefit and does not represent them. We've been holding conference calls and having meetings with your offices since June, not because a light just needs to be shed on this injustice, but because Congress does have influence in preventing these tragedies from occurring. As Donna mentioned, we have seen um, Susia has entered into negotiations with the Israeli army. This isn't something that normally happens, and we have been told repeatedly that your help and your intervention in this matter is what is keeping these villages standing. So with that in mind, um, I'd like to turn the microphone back over to Donna and then to these personal stories. And of course, if you have any questions about this process, um, I'd be more than happy to provide more information and details after the briefing. The process is no building permits because there is no master plan. And a massive effort is funded by the British, the French, and the Belgians to register master plans, professionally developed master plans. Over 116 villages so far out of the 149 that are in the process. Um, a massive effort, hundreds of thousands of dollars, but now the High Court saying there would be no Palestinian representation in the approval process. And that too has to be reconsidered. That too is, is an issue to take bring forward because after all, towns plan, they issue permits, they, they, they zone, they create their future based on their own vision and these towns should be no different than that. So with that, I'd like to introduce Fatma to welcome you to the microphone. I think come here if you would and, um, and please give us a bit of dis discussion of, of well, you know, we can, I can start in English. Okay. I'm not sure what you said. 
Uh, I was born uh, in Susia Old Village uh, in 1978. Uh, Israel uh, spilled us uh, from our village in, uh, in, 19, in 1986. And they did demolition uh, many times from 19... Uh, 59 until uh, 2001, uh, seven times. After that, the demolition uh, uh, from uh, 2011 until uh, 2012, uh, some houses. And now they con want to continue on to demolition our village. Uh, our village is very simple village. We are live in the tent, and, uh, and also with difficult life. Not like not easy under the sun, under um, under uh, the rain. But anyway, we have to stay in our village and uh, stop the mission. Uh, we are we are here to ask you to help us to stop the mission. Uh, we hope you help us. Okay. One, one thing. You asked me to ask you some questions. So yeah. one question that we talked about when when the old Susia was demolished, there were a thousand people. What happened? Where did they go? So you said that they didn't all stay anymore. No. Uh, in nineteen eighty six. Yeah. What does it mean when, when, when you were forcibly removed? They go to the neighboring villages or other other land. We go to our, our land, our village land uh, around the uh, village hall and live there. Some, uh, people, some people didn't go there. Some, some people go to Jordan Valley, some people go to uh, Yatta town, and some people stay in this uh, land uh, around Susia all. Uh, we are continuing on our land. Uh, when we was uh, us from our village, uh, they say we cannot uh, live in this land, uh, this village, social village. I was the academic. It's ecological land, the Israeli state was declared. Yeah. Yeah. And then they, after a little month, they bring one uh, settler and live it in uh, our village. Or, yeah. So, so even though they told you no one can live in the archaeological area, now others are living, but the settlers are living in the archaeological site. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Do you have to say the things? I think you got it, maybe. Yeah, no, I, uh, I will say about the main piece for us. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the main piece for us is. Uh, Security life, security uh, people, security and save life for our family, for our community, in our place. Uh, save our children, save our uh, village non demolition. Please stop beside our us and support us. Thank you. His name is Aysar. He's 14 years old. Um, and he would like to present his speech to you. You can stand up. Easier to translate. Assalamu alaikum. Assalam, assalamu amin wa al-muhabu wa al-ihtiram bayna al-nihas. Uh, what's mean the peace? The peace was it's the respect between the people themselves and the states each other, their lives and their I mean, traditional way to live. What's your hobby look? And other people. 
I hope so, and I ask you just to help us at least to be to stay in our land, in our village of Susia, and help us to stop the demolition and evacuation. And to protect us from the settlers and the army attack, which mostly sometimes does daily. And the, the main goal to us to live in peace with other religions, and the Jewish and the Christians must live together and live in peace uh, in all our life. Thank you. I want to tell you that I saw this, um, a key person when he walks to school, because all the children walk with him, and they, they have to pass a settlement that, like he says, it, it, it's not easy, and it hasn't been called. Um, so he's been watching out for all the other school children. <laughs> really honored that he could come, and everyone who helped with getting his visa, I really want to thank you. That was a, a challenging process. Um, next, let's move. Uh, to Naima, yes. Uh, we would like to, I want Naima to, to speak. Um, she's, of course, a teacher from Umaha. Hello. Um, I come today to here um, to explain how to life in Omar Khair, special women and um, kids because I am mother to three daughters. Uh, the last uh, demolition in Omar Khair on uh, 27th of October, the last year, um, I, I had two daughters in my house uh, and my, um, my mother stayed with my mother because I go to school. Uh, when I go to school in 27 uh, October, my husband in the morning after when I go to school call me and now I must step now. Um uh, al the soldier and uh, a lot of buildings that come to Um damage, I don't know, damage any house. Uh, say, okay, I'm very fair. And very quickly to Omar Khair. When I when I uh, uh, arrived arrive on Omar Khair, I saw the first uh, the house uh, uh, the house for woman from Omar Khair from Hadarin. She born a newborn and demolish all demolish in Agra. She under the uh, under the sun and the newborn and cry. And I keep a step to uh, look at my daughters and when I say uh, the house my mother is demolition. So so I see my mother in the ground in this severe situation and keep look my daughter where is my daughter see my daughter lives she for a year and the miserable situation she crying she shocked because she thought the soldier run after two 
two men from Italy to take photos, and she thought the soldier ran behind she, and she crying. She shook. She she suffered four months after the demolition. So I come here to ask you to stop the demolition house in Omar Khair in Susa and any village to stop suffering family. Thank you. What you need to be sensing is demolitions happen at any time. You get 10 minutes notice. He might tell you about Wednesdays and why that matters. It's 10 minutes anytime, even in the Lakaba village. The call comes to us every three months. 10 minutes, bulldozers are on their way. And it, our best effort is to mobilize every diplomatic energy we can to, to, to change the course of those bulldozers. So this level of uncertainty, what Fatima said was that Demolitions have happened over and over and over again. Not, a, not the whole town, some of the town. A few houses this time, a few houses that time. You never know if it's yours, and you never know if it's today. It, it can be two in the morning when this begins. Um, this isn't city planning. This, this has, has to be, there's got to be another way. I ask them next, though, on the positive side, and the thing that we hold on to it is Pinwheels for Peace. Um, Sadine has a message for you. I want her to sit next to her mom. And um, we can adjust, adjust this a little bit. Um, 
I I'm often asked as an Israeli Jew if I ever see a solution to the Israeli Palestinian conflict. It's a question I get from everybody when I meet people for the first time and they don't know me. And it's difficult. Sincerely, I don't. I've seen so much injustice and dreams shattered, um, so much humiliation in the 20 years that I've been trying to um, work for some sort of social change in the region. And it's difficult because the government that is supposedly representing me, that's supposedly saying that they want peace and that they need human rights, or it's the shining democracy of the Middle East, does almost everything in its power to maintain and administer a politics of separation and occupation. So when faced with such like an ordeal of such a big power, um, one often can become very cynical or feel a certain hopelessness um, in fighting for change. And and I try to think what inspired me, what keeps me going um, over so many years. And I mean, one reason is I have some very, very dear friends living there who I care tremendously about. But, and sometimes that's enough to go and protect and fight for them, or with them, or for them. But I'm also very much inspired. And where I come from, inspiration is something I don't see a lot. And the inspiration that I get doesn't come from politicians or from people who have power. It comes from, really, from ordinary people. And for me, the inspiration comes from, um, from my friends. And one, and maybe I can convey this, because the best way I can convey this is um, a friend of mine from the village of Susia, the village of Fatme and Aisa and Amudi. Um, one day we were sitting down um, over some chai, some tea, and he was telling me that he was summoned by the Shabak, the Israeli secret police. And they interrogated him and asked him, um, who are those Jewish Israelis who come here every week for so many years? What are they doing with you? What are they talking? What are you planning? <coughs> and he told them, he said, you're the Israeli secret police. You know everything. I have a tent. You can come wherever you come whenever you want. You have cameras, you have everything. I really have I don't hide anything. And they warned him that continuing these inviting us, continuing seeing us, will cause him and his village a lot of trouble. And he answered them that um, these Jewish Israelis have never given me any demolition orders. So I think they're pretty good. They're pretty OK. <coughs> and he was released with a warning. But the story gets better, because a few days later, he gets summoned again, but this time not by the Israeli secret police, but by the Palestinian secret police. And they ask you the same question. Who are these Jewish Israelis? Why are you meeting with them? What are you doing with them? And he tells them that I don't know what the Palestinian Authority is doing for me. I don't know what the Israeli government is doing for me. But I know what my friends are doing for me. And he was released with a warning that he might be considered as a collaborator with the Israeli enemy, something that for Palestinians is something very, very difficult and dangerous. <laughs> so when he was released, he still continues to invite me and other people to his home um, and continues to work with us, continues to see us like the same level of eyes, still working together. And what he goes through, what he's willing to do, go through one interrogation after another, or to invite us into his into his world, 
Well, I can, me with my blue ID card, I can go in and out, travel, don't have to fear have demolitions, don't have to wake up like 10 minutes before I know that my home is going to be destroyed. So, if he's, if he's willing to go through that, he's making a step for a certain reality of coexistence. I'm not really doing much. I'm doing a two hour drive from Tel Aviv all the way to South Africa and coming back to my nice home. And, and that brings me to the point that we, who come from a privileged position, we, have, we and our ordinary people, we can demand from those who are in power, those who have, who have influence, to tell them, you need to start with demolition, you need to give people there their lives so they can live like peacefully and not wake up like to the sound of bulldozers, to the sound of soldiers. When you see like a house being de demolished, you're not seeing a house being demolished. You are seeing basically a life being demolished. So if you can do anything, write about it, talk to people, write to your senator for the president, then do it. They're not asking for much. Thank you. I want to move to um, our last speaker, Eid Bani. I, we will be taking some questions, so Eid, I'd like you to, to bring, us, bring this all together for us, please. Thank you. which happened in very year of 80 in the villages um, in the south or in Jordan Valley. It's the same, the same policy for the Israeli government to demolish the house everywhere. And uh, the, the problem is you see the outposts which have been created beside the Palestinian villages. Uh, I mean, one caravan was built in there and the Satari can have electricity, water, and everything. But at the same time, which is illegal, even in Israeli law, it's illegal. This outpost, it's not a settlement. And at the same time, they came to you and demolish your house. And when you appeal to the Israeli court, because you live in the U.S.C., that's me. Anything you must deal with the Israeli court, not with the Palestinians. And almost the cases was ruined. They, they, we lose the case in the Israeli court because it is so weak to apply to Israeli code. And a lot of files was being done to demolish. The demolition that was so painful that anything, it is the most, I think, the, the most high level of violence from the IDF and the, the Israeli government to just they came to you in one morning which very quiet for me, very morning, almost in the, in the, in the winter time, which means it was very cold and witty and rainy, and they threw all of your stuff outside, and the bulldozer in five minutes just demolished the house. That's, first of all, it's very painful and big news for those families who completely Almost they built this house and they pay a lot of money just to have this house. And very painful for the kids who face the, the psychological problems in, in deep in their self. Long years sometimes. I know many children who are suffering a lot. And uh, the problem is it's not uh, the demolition is not happening because the security of Israel. It is a completely different story. The security was a different issue, and the devotion of the house just to evacuate the families from area C to go away. I mean, to I mean, the state is have to make to take more land and control it and abuse the Palestinians to go outside of those land who is off and the devotion of private land. It's completely against the international law I think the demolition and um, I hope so it's we can make something to stop that because it's the most the most painful thing which I mean uh, every family was facing in the south 
of the West Bank, like Susia and my village of Alger, and in the Jordan Valley, it's happened completely weekly, the demolition and the evacuation. And uh, yeah, it is unbelievable. Thank you. My village's name is Oman Kher. The meaning of the village is the, the mom of the good things. That's the name. Yeah. You can spell it with me. Oman Kher. Yeah. Okay. Why should they say the name of this village? Why we should uh, uh, say this name of the village? Because my village was always the, the people very selfish actually and they want to be live in peace and they didn't ask a lot of I mean they didn't ask a lot in their life they just want to live in peace work their daily life and uh, without uh, the idea of I mean uh, 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 getting inside the village and bothering the people to move them away and demolish their house and the people very simple they're not looking out, you know, a lot of things to have in their life. That's very... The main goal of the people to stay in their piece of land that they own, which is private, actually. It's not, I mean, they take it from somebody just as... Uh, and, yeah, it is... And the problem is that Israeli government just specifically always came to these simple villages that they want to demolish. And that's the problem. I don't know why. It is, they leave all the problems with defense and security which are to the state of Israel, just that they came to the villages, which is very simple. And the Israeli settler Jews who live in a villa close to mine, because southern it was beside my village. And he, they offer him a lot of things to live in the settlements than the people who live in Tel Aviv, because in Tel Aviv the people pay a lot of taxes to the state. But the settler who live in the West Bank, he didn't pay any taxes, just he had a nice villa, and he had a protection, he had guns, he had, he can use the law by his gun, and we see many things happen, like they shoot many Palestinians, they control a lot of mountains by one sector, he can control two mountains just for himself, and nobody from the Palestinian can enter them. That's the racism, I mean, there is a line between the, the Israeli Jewish settlements and the Palestinians. If I, as a Palestinian, go and pass this way, I'm going to be shot and maybe, or be arrested as a terrorist who want to uh, take his life. At the same time, the people was, I mean, simple in the West Bank in these villages. And my village of Bakhir and Susia and other Palestinian villages, which 600 villages may be the same threat. When the settler do an action, he can shoot you, he can spell you from your lap by own weapon which he have found from the idea. That's not a terrorism, uh, I mean action against civilians. But if some Palestinian throw one stone, if it's not hit the, the car of the settler, you're going to be arrested or you're going to be shot in the state immediately. And that's a problem. The Israeli government pay a lot of money and uh, do a lot of investments in the settlements which out of the green line just to give the settlers the right to expel the Palestinians from their homeland and take more land to the Israeli state. And that's really big risk and problem. Yeah, <laughs> some questions on the yeah, so we've heard some really um, horrible stories about home demolitions and things. Um, but there, there are two things. One of them is immediate, and one of them is a bit more long-term. Um, immediately, one of the things that Rebuilding Alliance has done throughout the summer is we've encouraged constituents to call their senators and to call their representatives. And as Donna mentioned at the beginning of this briefing, to make two simple phone calls. One, to the State Department. Um, to make an official inquiry into this situation in villages like Susia or into Malher or another village that we have an urgent action for, and another to the Israeli embassy. One of the things, and, and this plays into the fact that a lot of these villages um, are considered to be unrecognized by the Israeli state, which means they're not on a map, 
Um, maybe registration hasn't formally occurred at the land, even though title goes back to the Ottoman era. When the Israeli embassy or when our senators or when the State Department gets a call and says, we know that people in the United States are concerned about these villages. People here know that they exist. People here have heard the stories of the people who live there and people here care about these places. Um, we've had a lot of success with Susia this summer. We've heard over and over again from the people who live there that it is congressional intervention, that it is these calls to the State Department and to the Israeli embassy that made the Israeli army think twice about moving forward with demolitions. That was in July. Now we're into September, and there was a lot of press. Maybe some of you saw some press coverage about Susia. We have to keep up this issue, not only with the State Department, not only in Congress, but also with the Israeli embassy. These are small villages. They're villages of 20, 30 people, sometimes more, sometimes less. But these are, these are, these are people and their lives. And so the immediate thing that you can do as a constituent is, if you're a constituent in this room, I know we have some staffers here as well, is to call your senator, call your representative, write them a letter. Um, I have templates of all of those things that we can provide to you that says, I heard about Susia, I heard about the Malher, I'm concerned, and I would like you to make an official inquiry to the State Department. The other thing that we're working on, and, and why it's really important in addition to that, for the Congress to be involved, is that we would actually like to see more U.S. support of Palestinian planning rights. And we have um, a couple things moving forward. Um, we have some ideas, and I'll let Donna talk about them. But I, this is something that our government should stand up for. We, we hold private property rights um, and equality before the law to be something that we declare as important to our government and to our laws. Um, and, and Palestinians should have the same rights that are afforded to Israelis as well, um, and also to people in this country. So, and if Donna would like to add anything to that, I'll encourage her, but as a constituent, as a staffer, um, take calls from your constituents, have meetings with Rebuilding Alliance, have meetings with constituents and acknowledge the names um, of these villages that previously you might not have ever heard of before. Expropriation of private land is something that crosses the aisle. It's something that's of concern everywhere. We've been looking at something called political risk insurance. Imagine insuring their houses against demolition. We would insure the oil well if against expropriation. Now that it's being spoken about as, uh, as, as an annexation question in the Knesset, it's very much a political issue. And we should be so bold to speak um, openly and clearly about American values, values of private property, standing for people's ability to hold on to their neighborhoods and to plan their, their towns and villages. Um, it's pretty much the way we've, we've, these are values that are common to us, so very important. And we hope that constituents would take that action. Just make a call. Ask your congressman to make two calls on your behalf. Do you, would you add to it? Yeah. Please, a question. How many years have they been fighting? 50 years. <laughs> 2,000. Yes. Not, not forever. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's no fight actually every year. But the problem is sometimes there is a war done in Gaza every two years from the Israeli government against Gaza. Uh, that's an issue which is very big, more than the motion from the staffers or from the IDF. That's completely look like uh, it's a it's not a battlefield between both armies who fight daily, but it's a fight between people who control your land and the army who protect them and even help them to expel you away from your land. That's me. I think it's, it's part of violence, daily violence against the Palestinians, uh, villagers and citizens who live in these uh, small villages who is far away from any protection from politicals. The problem is those villages mine 
formal current uh, Susia in the south, we are in the deep inside area C. That means the Palestinian Authority haven't any rights to support economy or defend them uh, against the Israeli settlers' uh, actions or attacks. And uh, because they're small villages, they don't care. It's you know far away from attention, we can say. But uh, the last case of Susia last summer and all of this, I mean, uh, media who go inside Susia and they uh, stop in front of the Israeli uh, civil administration who want to demolish Susia and evacuate Susia away. And why we came here? Because Israel didn't hear anybody in the world who spoke, asked to stop the demolition of Susia and over here, but we. When the, when the spokesman of the White House, John Kirby, you know, of the Security of Foreign Affairs, he spoke about Susia specifically and asked, and they want to speak with the Israeli government to dialogue about Susia. Then it was quiet and stopped a little bit. There is a delegation to a meet on the against Susia in this month, I think, from the Israeli civil administrations again to open the case. And until now, but the pressure was. The benefits of the pressure was done. I mean, it's quite, they, they couldn't go inside the village and demolish it because the world was uh, interested about Susia and they want to, okay, now we check you, we see you. If you go and uh, do an action against Susia, it's going to be not so acceptable from the international law. And because of that, it's, it's quiet until now. And we hope it's going to be continuous to be, be protected from activists, from the media, around the world, and even here, which we can do too. Yes. Okay. You mentioned earlier about there's now negotiations between the Israeli civil authority and uh, members of Zizia. Could you describe a little more about what those negotiations look like? So, yes. It's about Zizia. Yes, I yes. I heard from Rabbi Arab. Yes. So, it's rabbis for human rights that's taking on the negotiation role. So the, the legal team is based with rabbis for human rights. Um, and Rabbi Eric Asherman has been quite a spokesperson on the whole issue. Um, his, his, his update this morning was that they'll continue the negotiations. It's been extended twice. Um, there, the, the briefing is, uh, or the, the discussion there is whether the villagers, they're being pressed to move further away from the settlement of Susia. The fear is that if they move away, and they know this from experience, Fatma might even speak to some of this, the families who moved away lost their agricultural land. What does that mean? It meant the settlers came and planted on their land. They planted vineyards, and suddenly, land that is critical to the family's ability to survive, because this is subsistence agriculture, and, and all of their production and all of their income, that, that income was lost, that land was lost to them. So the villagers are very, very much aware that they can't, that they, they can't allow themselves to be displaced. It, it, it's, it's, their, it's their home, it's their land, and their livelihood that they're talking about. I think that our, the next date coming up in the negotiations is October 13th. Um, and so you keep, keep your eye on it uh, as it happens there. Can I, can I add it? Okay, so, um, so what happened this summer after, um, and I, I just, I wanted to add two things. So after um, the May hearing, um, when all of Susia's demolition orders were reissued um, and no freeze orders were put out, the head of all 13 member delegations for every EU member state that has an office in Palestine came to Susia in support of Susia. It wasn't until nearly a month and a half later when the US started to ex um, express interest or concern about this issue that the Israeli the army then entered into negotiations. We cannot understate how important a simple private phone call from the office of a senator or a representative to the Israeli army is. It doesn't have to be anything too public, but we, I really want to reiterate that if you're taking things back to your office, to other staff members, or to your bosses. The second thing about um, the negotiations that they've entered into, 
the, the starting point of negotiations for the Israeli army was that the, the residents of Susia live, re, li, leave land that they legally own. That was a starting point of negotiations. They said, okay, we'll enter into negotiations with you, which means we won't demolish your homes, but we would really like for you to live somewhere else. And more than the specifics of the negotiations, it's the principle that this is, this is private Palestinian land within the West Bank, within the Green Line, threatened by expanding Israeli settlements, where the negotiating points that are being used to say, oh, well, the Israeli army is, is trying, is to forcibly remove people from their land and away from their livelihoods and away from land that they legally own. Um, and we can provide more details about the specifics of the negotiations if you'd like, but Susia is one example of, of many. And this process of using the master planning process, and we've talked about a lot of things, but using this planning process, the Israeli settlement of Susia has continued to be allocated additional dunams of land, 1,500 dunams of additional land, into what was originally private Palestinian land, which is now being declared state land for Israeli settlement expansion. So negotiations between the army and Susia are simply about the residents of Palestinian Susia moving off of the land that they own, and that's something that our government and we're here to stand um, against, and we hope you will as well. So that, uh, we can take further questions up. Offline. Um, I want to thank you for joining us for this briefing. I'm really honored that our guests were able to come from so far away. And, um, and I hope you'll take action. Simple actions count. And if you, if you'd be delighted to talk about legislative action as well. We've got some drafts. And so, thank you. Also, we're here, I know it's a crazy week, but we're here until Thursday. If you would like to schedule a private briefing, with our team or with some members of our team, either with, um, we know that the House is out of session this week, but with the Senator's office or just with staff, um, come talk to me. I'm scheduling meetings. Um, I can give you my business card and happy to arrange something a little bit more in depth if you think um, this would be something of interest to your office. Thank you very much.